The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Our epistle reading for this evening comes to us from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the second chapter. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. We continue with our second Psalm, Psalm 1, found on page 16 of your bulletin. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. I invite you to rise for the reading of the gospel. And the holy gospel comes to us according to St. Luke, the 14th chapter. When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But Jesus said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servants to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, sir, what you commanded has been done and there is still room. And the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. This is the gospel of our Lord. I invite your attention now to page four as we confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And grace to you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, if you watch any car commercial ever, and I do mean any one, they all have the same thing on them. You got to look closely, but it's there. Now, the car commercial will show like, I don't know, the Dodge Ram or whatever. It'll show it driving on this beautiful, pristine, untouched road, beautiful mountain wilderness. Everything's great. Everything's excellent. And then at the bottom, it says in very small writing, professional driver, closed course, do not attempt. I said, well, thanks a lot. That looks great. Why can I not attempt that in your truck? It looks super. They all say that. There's always like a little disclaimer that'll show up on there that says, don't, don't try this. Professional driver, don't try driving in an untouched wilderness. It looks like too much fun. My favorite ever disclaimer that I ever saw in a commercial to this day was for a commercial for Fig Newtons that came out in the 1980s. And no, before you ask, it didn't say professional Newtons don't eat, no. The disclaimer, it was the commercial had the queen enjoying some Fig Newtons, like on her balcony and saying, let them eat fruit and cake. And at the bottom, in very small type, it said, simulated queen. Just to make sure it's not the real one. But there's one ad that has stuck out in my mind quite a lot recently. Uh, it's an ad for, I think it's Sobeys or Save On Foods, doesn't matter, one or the other. And it shows people winning something and like jumping around and having a good time in the store and like there's groceries flying everywhere and they're all like hugging each other. And at the very bottom of the screen, it says in very small type, filmed before COVID. Because you know, if you've done what I've done, you've seen people doing things like on TV where they like shake hands or hug or whatever. You like, you get all worked up about it. You say, what? What are you doing? You can't do that. Like be, be serious. You know, you can't hold hands and hug and have a party. It's crazy. And yet in today's gospel reading, there's the story of a party, of a feast. And we're all saying right now, if somebody were to invite you to a feast today, if somebody were to say to you, great news, I'm having a feast at my place, you'll love it, I've invited everybody, and I do mean literally everybody. Like I had people go into the hedgeways and highways and invite everybody that we could find. Are you coming? And you say, are you crazy? No, I'm not going to that. There's a 10 person limit. You're out of your mind. Sure. But you can remember being invited to things that you might have gone to. And not only that, you can remember being invited to things that you tried to get out of. You can remember being invited to an event or a party or a function. You said to your spouse or to your friend or your plus one, you said, do we have to go to this? I kind of don't want to. I kind of, like, why don't you want to go to that thing? You know why you don't want to go to that thing. Because you have better things to do. You are looking at your time and you're saying, I don't really want to go to this party or this event or this function or this dinner. I have better things to do with my time. And when that first raft of people are invited in that parable, there's the big feast that's made and the invitation goes out. So come to this feast. And the people that are invited, they say, I got better things to do. I, I've, I've, I've bought some oxen. I bought some land. I have a wife. I have other more pressing concerns. I don't really want to go to your thing because the things that I want to do are more important or at least more important to me. And so they don't go. They turn their nose up at that invite and refuse to go. Now the interesting thing for me is not that people would reject the invitation of God. That's simple enough. The interesting thing to me are the people who accept, the people who do end up going. It says here, after the servant came and reported these things to his master, the master of the house became angry. And he said to his servants, go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. Bring those people. And this is a long, long, long time before you had our kind of society in which if you are blind or poor or crippled or lame, that there is some kind of social safety net to catch you. In the time of Christ, you were begging and you had very little, if anything, at all. You were not just poor, you were really poor. So if somebody says to you, 
come to my feast. You who are begging on the street for scraps and crumbs, you who are getting by on the kindness of strangers, you who are shaking a cup and hoping somebody drops something in there, all of you are invited to a feast. You are invited to open bar. There is no limit on the pilsners that you can have at this. That kind of thing. Well, those are the people who are going to show up. The people who are going to show up are the people who know their need. They'll show up, and they'll be happy to do it. The whole point about everybody being invited, and truly, it's not just the poor and the blind and the crippled and the lame and the whatnot. You have the servants saying, there is still room, and the master saying, go out into the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. Everybody is invited. It is an open invitation, but only the people who know their need are going to show up. Everybody else is going to be too busy. Everybody else is going to say, I've got better things to do. I don't need this meal. I don't need this party. I've got a wife. I've got my yoke of oxen. I bought this land. I've got better things to do than go to this thing. But those who know that they're poor, those who know that they're lame, those who know that they are blind and crippled, those who feel the need for the love of God, in their lives, will grasp at this invitation. I want to call your mind back to the reading that we had from Proverbs, where it talked in Proverbs about not reproving uh, a scoffer because it's not going to do you any good. He who corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse, and he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase in learning. You are going to find an awful lot of people who will say of the Lord their God, I don't need him. I got better things to do. I've got a wife. I've got oxen. I've got land. I've got football on TV. I've got everything that I need. Everything is fine. I have literally all that I need. What need I of God? And if you sit them down, you say, you do realize that at some point things are going to get real bad, and you may notice that you develop a need for the Lord your God. They may scoff, and they may walk on. But for those of us who know our need for the Lord our God, who've set our minds on things above, not on things below, who yearn for the goodness of that great God, who whispers wisdom to us, who shares with us the truth of the scriptures, who informs us of his great and deep abiding love for his creation that he entered into and lived and died on our behalf, who comes to us in simple things like water and bread and wine, who is here amongst us in word and sacrament. For those of us who need him, and boy, do we need him, he satisfies the longing of our restless hearts. And the sad fact of the matter is, the people who were invited to that feast needed it too. But they didn't think they did. But the invitation's open. The invitation is open to everybody. There's a wonderfully comforting thing at the end of that parable where God says that he wants his house to be full. He wants everybody to be there. He's quite keen to have everybody show up and to be invited and to take part in his feast. That's what he wants. The reluctance is not on his part. It's on ours. The door is locked from our side only, not from his. The invitation is there. The Lord your God wants you at his marriage feast. And the only thing keeping anybody from it is they can't see that they need it. But once you do, once you've noticed that the Lord your God, who made heaven and earth, who has control of all things, who has the whole world in his hand, that that same Lord has invited you to sit at his table and share in his meal, what wonderful words those are to be blessed by a God who cares so much for his creation that needs him. Amen. And now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and your minds always in Christ Jesus. Amen. 
I invite you to rise for the act of thanksgiving found on page four. Almighty God, we lift up our hearts in gratitude to you and for all your loving kindness, we bless your holy name. For life and health, for love and friendship and for the goodness and mercy that have followed us all the days of our life, we praise you, O God. For the wonder and beauty of the world and for all things true and honorable, just and pure, lovely and gracious, we praise you, O God. For the gift of Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, from the grace and truth which came by him and for his obedience unto death, even death upon a cross. We praise you, O God, for his glorious resurrection and ascension to your right hand and for his kingdom and glory and everlasting dominion. We praise you, O God, for the Holy Spirit, the counselor, the Lord and giver of life, for your holy church throughout the world, for all the means of grace and for the fellowship of the redeemed in heaven and on earth. We praise you, O God. Glory, thanksgiving, and praise be to you, O Father Almighty, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, because you have committed to your people the ministry of intercession, hear us as we pray for others and grant that our hearts may be filled with peace and love for your holy church throughout the world that you would bestow on the ministers of your word and sacraments, the abundance of your grace and truth, and confirm your people in the faith of the gospel that Christ may be exalted as head over all. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord. For your people here and everywhere, that you would inspire them with love for your house, zeal in your service, and joy in the advancement of your kingdom. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord for the nations that you would breathe on them the spirit of peace and understanding and for those in authority that you would inspire in them a true desire for peace and love of concord. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord, for all our schools and colleges and for all who teach in them and all who learn that in humility of heart they may ever look to you, the fountain of all wisdom. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord, for all in sickness and distress that you would give strength to the weary, relief to the suffering and comfort to the dying. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord. For all your servants who have departed this life in your faith and fear, we give you hearty thanks. We pray you to give us grace to follow them as they followed Christ. Bring us with them to those things which eye has not seen nor ear heard. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. You may be seated. For those of you who are joining us online tonight, that ends our time together this evening. Uh, we will be reconvening at 11 o'clock on Sunday because we are in, well, I mean, if you're online, you're only ever watching us online at 11 o'clock, so your schedule has not changed. For those of you who are in person, your schedule may have changed. Ordinarily throughout the year, we have services at 8.30 and 11 o'clock. In the summertime, you're all gonna say to me, Pastor Jim, surely we have service at 10 o'clock in the summer. Yeah, I know we usually do, but desperate times call for desperate time changes. Uh, and right now we are looking at trying to keep things as seamless for our online component as they are now because people have a lot of different time changes. They've become very accustomed to watching us online at 11 o'clock. So we're gonna keep it that way for now. So throughout the summertime, you can see us at 11 o'clock. And if you're going to say, but I don't like time changes, I don't like that at 11 o'clock, then great, join us online at, uh, on Wednesday evenings at seven. That's not changing either. Most everything else is wrapping up. So our Bible study will be happening on Sunday morning, but things like confirmation class is already over. Youth group, we're having our last one on Friday. Our, our book study ended this evening, that kind of thing. So uh, expect to see me uh, on your phone more uh, as my time frees up and I can get to calling you more. All right, go your way in peace and safety.